When you look at Imam Hussein and you compare him to the universe, to creation, to the people, you feel like sometimes the universe is revolving around Imam Hussein. All of creation wants Hussein. All of creation wants Hussein. It's as if Imam Hussein is standing, all of creation is behind him, just looking to Imam Hussein. But that's where we stop sometimes. Who is Imam Hussein looking at? The same way that all of the creation and universe is looking at him. Who is he looking at like this? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Beauty of Allah. Beauty of Allah. If we're going crazy, if the world is going crazy and in the love of Imam Hussein, Imam Hussein is going the same for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We always go all the way up to Ashura in our lectures, in our in our musibah and all that. What's the last thing we say before they finish the job of Hussein? Ridan biradak. We end with Tawheed. That's where it's supposed to start. That's where the story starts. Tawheed is where it starts. All the good stuff comes out of Tawheed, Ma'rifatullah. So I was thinking, maybe it's a good idea. If we're going to be saying Labbaik Ya Hussein to start with Tawheed. If we're gonna say Labbaika Ya Hussein then, then let's start with saying Labbaika Ya Lord of Hussein. The Lord of Hussein. والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا أبا القاسم محمد وعلى لبيته الطيبين الطاهرين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي Shaykh Muhammad Al-Hilli, distinguished guests, brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. On behalf of Aliman Australian community, I would like to welcome you all to the last night of our Muharram lecture series. Aliman kindly requests you to respect the following rules. Please make sure that all your mobile phones are switched off or put on silent. Please ensure that your cars are parked legally. We request that there be no loitering outside the hall during the program as well as after, so we do not disturb the neighbours surrounding the venue. We also request your cooperation with all volunteers to allow the night to run smoothly. Al-Iman thanks you for your patience and support. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Every day throughout the lecture series, we began the program with the recitation of the Holy Quran. And as the lecture series comes to an end, we must ask ourselves, what relationship shall we have with the Holy Quran in our everyday lives from now on? If we believe the Quran is a guide for us, then how can it be such if we do not seek guidance from it? If we acknowledge its importance, then we should give it the time it deserves. Imam Ali salam said, Belief means appreciation with the heart, acknowledgement with the tongue, and action with the limbs. The Quran is like the ocean. Some people remain at its shores, some swim further out, and others dive deep into it. An average person who has no time for the Quran will understand nothing but the initial meaning. But those who want to expand their knowledge can study it their entire lives and never exhaust its supplies. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Holy Quran, Verily, we have revealed the book to you in truth for instructing mankind. He that receives guidance benefits his own soul, but he that strays injures his own soul. So are we content with injuring our own souls 
or are we ready to receive the benefits of this guiding light? We only have a singular opportunity to understand the purpose of our existence and to strive towards it, and that should be enough as a motivation for action. On that note, please welcome Brother Muhammad Ali to the stage to recite verses from the Holy Quran with three loud salawats ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad.
وَإِذَا حَلَلْتُمْ فَاصْطَادُوا يَا شهر الحرام ولا الهدي ولا القلائد لا الشهر الحرام ولا الهدي ولا القلائد ولا البيت الحرام يبتغون فضلا من ربهم ورضوانا البيت الحرام يبتغون ولا يجرمنكم شنآن قوم أنصدوكم عن المسجد الحرام ولا يجرمنكم شنآن قوم أصدوكم عن المسجد الحرام أنصدوكم عن المسجد الحرام أن تعتدوا وتعاونوا على البر والتقوى و. 
Thank you, brother, for that beautiful recitation. May Allah deepen your understanding of the glorious Quran. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. A reminder that tonight's program includes a question and answer session with Sheikh Muhammad al Hilli. So if anyone still has any questions, please pass them on to the volunteers. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Before we continue, I'd like to take this opportunity to first thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for blessing us with these beautiful 11 nights and for guiding us to the path of Ahlul Bayt alayhi For without the blessings of Allah, these nights could not be possible. Secondly, Al-Iman Australian community would like to thank everyone who made these nights a success. We would like to thank our learned speaker, His Eminence Sheikh Muhammad Al-Hilli, the organizers, all volunteers, all our reciters and those who donated refreshments and to anyone that helped in any way. We express our sincere appreciation and thanks. We are often asked, who is Al-Iman? The answer is always quite simple. Al-Iman is each and every one of you in this hall. From the learned speakers who share their knowledge with us, to the dedicated volunteers and to you, the dedicated followers of Ahlul Bayt alayhi for without your attendance here every night and your continuous support and encouragement over the past 20 years, there would be no Al-Iman. From your presence here as seekers of knowledge to your donations that will keep spreading the message of Imam Hussain around the world, as well as helping those in need. Not forgetting your excellent manners and the way you showed respect by quietly listening. Al-Iman sincerely thanks you and we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards you abundantly. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, whoever joins himself to another in a good cause shall have a share of it. 
and whoever joins himself to another in an evil cause shall have the responsibility of it. Don't underestimate your individual efforts, as each and every one of you have made these nights possible. We would also like to thank you for all your loud, beautiful, uplifting salawats which have blessed our gatherings. So I ask you from the bottom of your hearts to please recite another salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Al Imam would also like to give a special thanks to our learned speaker for this Muharram lecture series, Sheikh Muhammad Al Hilmi, for the time and knowledge he has shared with us. Allah says in the Holy Quran, and whoever is granted wisdom, he indeed is given a great good. Therefore, we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant Sheikh Muhammad Al Hilmi more wisdom and to protect him on his humble mission to increase our awareness about the beauty of Islam and Ahlul Bayt May Allah also reward his family for their patience in his absence and we pray for his safe return to his loved ones. On that note, please welcome Sheikh Muhammad al Hilmi once more to the stage with three of your loudest salawats ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم صلى الله عليك سيدي ومولاي يا أبا عبد الله وعلى الأرواح التي حلت بفنائك عليك مني سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار ولا جعله الله آخر العهد مني لزيارتكم السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيتها النفس المطمئنة ارجعي إلى ربك راضية مرضية فادخلي في عبادي وادخلي جنتي On a night like this, on the plains of Karbala, after the tragic killing of Aba Abdullah al Hussein and his family members as well as companions, the enemies, the army of Umar bin Sa'ad, under the directions of Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, attacked the body of Aba Abdullah. A man came next to his decapitated body, looked at his hands and noticed there was a ring on the hands of Aba Abdullah. He attempted to take the ring out, but the hands and the ring was stuck on the fingers of Imam al Hussein. He took out a dagger, he began to sever the fingers of Aba Abdullah. The narrations tell us when they took whatever they can from the body of Imam al Hussein, there was a call by Umar bin Sa'ad, Ahrqu Khuyum al Zalimin. At that moment, they attacked the tents of the family of Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam 
The children began to run from all directions, screaming, Aina walidi, Aina ammi. Zainab salamullahi alayha would try to gather them, but they were scared due to the advances of the men as well as the horses. They began to place fire inside the tents. The tents began to burn. At that moment, the cries could be heard across the plains of Karbala. The children of Aba Abdullah and the Ahl al Bayt did not know which direction to go. Some of them would say, What shall we do? The others would reply, Save your lives. Umar bin Sa'id cried, Who will ride their horse and trample on the body of the companions of Hussein? Some of the companions had family, some of them had tribes like Al-Hur and Habib ibn Mudahir. They would object and say, this will never happen. He said, who will trample on the body of the family? The family would come forward. They would say, no one would trample on the body of Ali al-Akbar because he had some relations which existed in the army of Umar ibn Sa'ad. He began to name every family member and there would be a tribe would come and protect that family member. He then said, is there anyone who we should trample the body who does not have a tribe to protect him? They said, it is Hussein. He called out, O horsemen, sharpen your hooves and trample the body of Hussein. The ten horsemen began to advance towards the blessed body of Abba Abdullah al Hussein. His body was crushed to the extent that Imam Zain al Abidin says, I heard a noise that I have not heard before. It is as if some glass is being shattered. He asked Sayyidah Zainab, what is happening? Sayyidah said, they are trampling the body of your father, Aba Abdullah. When they came inside the tents, they began to loot whatever they wanted. They began attacking the daughters and the women of the Ahl al-Bayt, snatching off their hijab. A man came to Sukaina bint al-Hussein. He saw after snatching off her hijab that she was wearing earrings. He came next to her. He charged towards her. She screamed at him. He pulled off her earrings resulting in her ears bleeding profusely. They stole and attacked, and when they came inside the tent of Imam Zain al Abidin, Shimir looked at the son of Imam al Hussein. He said, I thought we have killed all the men. They replied, this is the son of Hussein who is suffering from an ailment. He picked up his sword to strike Imam Zain al Abidin. At that moment, Sayyid Zainab came out and said, By God, you will never strike him until you kill me first. She stood before him and Imam Zain al Abidin. The narrations tell us a historian by the name of Hamid ibn Muslim, or otherwise known as Humayd. On the plains of Karbala, when the children were running, he saw one young child of Imam al Hussein. Her dress had caught fire. She was running from one tent to another. He came to extinguish the fire on the dress. He looked at that lady and asked her, Why are you running? She said, Oh man, هل أنت معنا أم علينا؟ Are you with us or against us? He said, I am neither with you or against you. 
She said, Oh man, هل قرأت القرآن? قال نعم. قالت هل قرأت قول الباري عز وجل وأما اليتيم فلا تقرأ. قال نعم. قالت يا شيخ أنا يتيمة الحسن. فقال ما إلى أين تذهبين؟ قالت يا شيخ دلني إلى الغري show me the direction of Najaf when she looked towards Najaf she cried out السلام عليك يا جدا يا أمير المؤمنين she called out يا أمير المؤمنين this is what they have done to us not only have they killed our family members but they're violating our sanctity. Then she said to the man, Ya Sheikh, Dullani ila al-Furat, Dullani ila al-Alqami. Qala maadhi maadha, Why is it you want to go to the river bank of Alqami? She said, It is because my uncle Abbas is there. I wish to see him. They said he is found there. I wish to bid him farewell. The narrations tell us that they grouped the children together. They placed them next to each other. Eventually at the night, after they were calmed, they were presented with some water, but many of them would refuse to drink any water until they were passing it on from one person to another. One child eventually took the water and ran towards the battlefield. They said, where are you going? He said, I'm going to see Aba Abdullah al Hussein because he was thirsty. I wish to quench the thirst of Aba Abdullah. The narrations point that one Sayyid Zainab tried to gather the children, tried to gather the family members. She could not see Sukaina bint al Hussein. She came out, she looked for the daughter of Aba Abdullah. She saw Sukaina sitting next to the body of Imam al Hussein. But what kind of body was sitting, she sitting next to? They said the body of Imam looked like a piece of flesh full of arrows. It was as if it was like a hedgehog, whereby indeed every part was being affected. Sukaina sat next to their body. She began to cry and remember her father. All of a sudden, those around heard there was a voice from the direction of the body. It was the voice that Sukaina and others heard. The voice would say, Shi'ati mahma sharibtum adba ma in fadkuruni aw sami'tum bi gharibin aw shahidin fandubuni fa'ana sibtu alladhi min ghayr jurmin dhabahuni O oh my Shia, when you come to drink water, remember my thirst. Or remember a man who is by himself, then don't forget me. For I am the grandson of the Prophet that was slaughtered without any committing any wrong. The pointing of the narration say that at that time at night, when Sayyida Zainab tried to calm the children, tried to place them on their sleep, she wanted to perform Salatul Layl, but she could not do so standing up. She did so while sitting down. When they were asleep, she came out. She sat next to the body of Abba Abdullah, placed her hands under the body. She looked up to the heavens. She first out cried, Ya Jaddah, Ya Rasulallah, Wa Aliya, Wa Hamzata, Hada Hussein bil Ara, Muqatta al-A'za, 
مسلوب العمامة والرداء وبناتك سبايا She called out اللهم تقبل منا هذا القربان يا الله accept this قربان from us At that night سيدة زينب was constantly trying to watch for the children and the orphans of Aba Abdullah. The narration says, when she fell asleep for a short period, she was so concerned for the children that she saw one of the children missing. She came out, she was looking for that child. She saw that there was a lady fully covered. She saw that lady holding the child. She came next to that lady. She said to her, Ya Amat Allah, هذه يتيمة الحسين. O lady, this is the orphan of Aba Abdullah. She thanked the lady. Then she asked her, Who are you? The lady who had her head down lifted her head up. She said to Sayyida, she said, Oh Zainab, do you not recognize your mother, Fatima to Zahra? Sayyida Zainab said to her, Mother, Mother, don't blame me. If only you saw what I saw on the 10th of Muharram. Oh Mother Fatima, I lost my sons on the plains of Karbala. Oh Mother Fatima, I saw the bodies of Qasim and Ali in Al-Akbar. Oh, Mother Fatima, I had to take the body of Abdullah Ali in Al-Azghar. I saw the arrow on his neck. Oh, Mother Fatima, Abu Al-Fadl Al-Abbas did not return. His body is next to Furat without the right and the left. Oh, Mother Fatima, I saw what I saw. But what breaks my heart is I saw Shimmer sit on the chest of Abu Abdullah. Allah, Rahmatullah, Yala al Qawm al Zalimin, wa Sayyalam al Ladin, a Bolamu, a Yaman Kalabin Yan Kadibun, a Walla Kibatulin Muttaqi. When Nalilah, you are. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on this night of grief and sorrow for the Ahl al-Bayt, on the night of the remembrance of the Masaib of Ahl al-Bayt, on the night which was amongst the most difficult for the family of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive our sins, to accept our a'mal, to grant us tawfiq to perform the ziyarah of Aba Abdullah al Hussein shrine, and to attain his shafa'ah in akhirah, to place in our hearts the light of guidance, to grant us the strength to stand against our temptations. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant shifa to all mu'mineen and mu'minat around the world, we pray to him subhanahu wa ta'ala to hasten the reappearance of our 12th Imam, Sahib al Asri wa Zaman, Ruhi wa Arwah al Alameen al Luhul Fida, and to make us of his devout and sincere followers. I would like to ask you to recite Surah Al Mubarakat al Fatiha for the soul of all your marhumeen, but before it, loud salawat.
Salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Brothers and sisters, taqabbal Allah amalakum, adham Allah ajurakum. We have a lot of questions here, but inshallah we'll try to cover and uh, answer as many as possible, inshallah ta'ala. No particular order as, as they came. Uh, the question is, uh, if you have a job and you work at a restaurant and they make you serve haram food like pig or alcohol or other haram foods, are you allowed to serve it or do you have to quit your job? Of course, our ulama say that the uh, providing of prohibited food and drinks in specific terms, pork, as well as alcohol is prohibited in the religion of Islam in as far as the Sharia does not allow this for anyone for anyone as far as serving it for Muslims of course and non-Muslims so in that particular case there is a direction for the mu'mineen and mu'minat to find another job and not to serve this to Muslims or to non-Muslims and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala often provides us with uh, a better choice if we trust Him. And sometimes it's a bit of a hard decision to start off with. So I remember I heard this story from a brother that he was um, working in a company and uh, he could not find somewhere to pray except in the warehouse. You know, they have a warehouse where they store things. So the management found out and they said to him, you have to stop praying there because we're not allowing you. And he asked for anywhere else and they said, no, we don't have any place. And unfortunately, because in the UK, the weather is not very good, so he can't pray outside. So he had to quit his job. He said, I had to quit because I had to pray. I can't just for the sake of saying, you know, I don't have a place to pray. That's it, I'll pray qada. That's not good enough. So he quit his job. He said, I quit my job on the Friday, on the Monday, straight I got a call from a company, another company who offered me a much better position with a higher salary. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, it's very clear, it's a constitution. Do we trust Allah or not? That's the question. Allah says if you fear God, if you are God conscious and you're patient, it's going to need a little bit of difficulty. Allah says, we will give you a third way out. You might not know. You might think, oh, either poverty or I stay in this job. Allah says, يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجًا I will give you a third way out. وَيَرْزُقُ I'll give you rizq from that which you do not ever think about. Yes. So, entrusting that in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is highly recommended. What is the Islamic view of veganism? And I think there is another question. Uh, I recently became... A vegetarian mainly for health reasons I wanted to know Islam's stance on it I've been told that what I'm doing is wrong and that God made eating halal uh, eating meat halal now the religion of Islam has a number of uh, different uh, disciplines there is of course jurisprudence there is akhlaq there is spirituality and therefore as far as jurisprudence is concerned eating meat as long as it is uh, the biha that is permissible is no problem yes and being a vegetarian is not a problem provided we do not believe or spread the idea that being a vegetarian is wajib or eating meat is haram it's a personal choice you want to abstain from meat that is not a problem some recommendation narrations say it's better to eat meat once in 40 days, but this is out of recommendation. So there is istihbab, there is karahiyya, depends how you look at this narration, etc., etc. There's no issues in as far as fiqh is concerned. To be a vegan or a vegetarian, it's a choice, there is no problem. As far as spiritual progression and the heart is concerned, that is a separate story. We are told that excessive eating of meat, yes, is a problem for the spiritual purification. And it is, of course, physically, as far as health of the body is concerned, it's also not very um, necessarily positive. I read a statistic 
in the United Kingdom, I don't know here in the UK, uh, in Australia, but in the UK, the Muslims make up 2% of the population. 2%. But they consume 10% of the meat. 10%. Yes? Because, of course, we all, as Muslim community, you know, we love our meat. It has to exist in the uh, main diet. And, of course, may Allah help our sisters, the mothers, the wives, who one day try to prepare a vegetarian dish for their husbands. Yeah, it's not an easy choice to, to do. So, I think there is that attachment to me. But spiritually, it is said that if you want to advance, then it's better to limit the consumption of meat. Yes, yeah, so... In that sense, it is um, existing. Uh, what is the best way to complete reading the Holy Quran and understanding it completely? As I don't read or write in Arabic, reading it as English, is that acceptable or not? Reading the Quran must be in Arabic as well as other languages. Do not uh, ignore or abandon the reading and of the Quran in its original form. Nothing can replace the Arabic language. Allah says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, inna anzalnahu Qur'anan arabiyan la'allakum ta'qilun. There is a reason why the Quran is revealed in Arabic. So, you and I must place the emphasis to recite and learn recitation in Arabic. But, is that enough by itself? No. Yes, very quick story to highlight this. They say that once a, a young a boy said to his grandfather, I don't know Arabic and I'm not going to read the Quran in Arabic. It's pointless. It's useless. Because let me read it in English. At least I understand it. What's the point of reading in Arabic? He said very well. They were both uh, in this family retreat or holiday and they were in a, in a, man, in, in a house which you know required some, or was close in a mountainous region. So the grandfather says to the child, I'm going to give you a bucket of water and I want you to go to the river and get me some water from the river. I like the fresh water. So the child goes to the uh, river, fills the bucket and comes back but realizes the bucket has holes. So by the way, on the way coming back to the house, all the water had spilled from the bucket. So he's disappointed. He says to his grandfather, what's the point of this exercise? Why did you give me a bucket which has full of holes? Yes, or is broken and the water was spilling. He says, don't worry. Next day he asks him the same thing and he finds the bucket to be in the same manner. And the third, until the child says, I'm not doing it anymore. It's a pointless exercise. Every day I don't get much water back. And the grandfather says, I wanted to tell you, or this is a practical demonstration, that this bucket is like your heart. When I gave it to you, it was dirty. After three days, despite the fact that you brought it back to me without any water, it's being cleansed because of the water in it. Your heart too, you might not understand the Arabic, but by reciting the Arabic, it cleanses your heart. Even though you might not necessarily preserve the meanings and the teachings too. So, Quran must be recited in Arabic. What is the best way to understand it? Well, there must be a program of study for us throughout the year, as much as possible, to try and refer back to certain verses and to try and contemplate, or number one, to look at the meaning. And secondly, every verse we are able to link and somehow connect to it individually. Somehow it may appeal to us personally. So I would get this verse and I would reflect and I would ponder. When it comes to stories of the prophets, what would I have done in the position of Yusuf salam or Yunus salam? yes? Or when it comes to certain other recommendations in the Holy Quran, how would I apply it in my own life? The Imma alayhum salam says, Kam min qari'in min al-Qur'an la'anahu al-Qur'an. There are those who recite the Qur'an and the Qur'an sends the la'na upon them. Because we and I recite, وَقَضَى رَبُّكَ أَلَّا تَعْبُدُوا إِلَّا إِيَّاهُ وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا Be righteous and virtuous and respectful to your parents and we're not, God forbid, for example, yes? The Quran tells us that, for example, Say to the believers to lower their gazes. Yes, but we watch haram. So the Quran is saying, well, you're reciting. This is clear. But if we're not reflecting and not applying, then unfortunately it has this kind of response towards us. Um, I'm currently a university student. And as many would agree, exam period is often very stressful. This has become an issue for me because it fills me with anxiety and stress often distracting me even from my salah. What is your advice and what dua and prayers do you recommend? Of course, examinations and tests are part and parcel of our lives. 
this life is a big examination as we have to get that all desired success at the end of it but throughout our lives of course we are tested in that particular manner in that we have to go through some recognition of our um, learning some demonstration of the education uh, no doubt there are many things we can do number one we are told sadaqa would help yes for the this idea secondly any dua or a'mal as we mentioned salat al salat al-layl are good for the fulfillment of hajat this is also important there is a dua that was mentioned by prophet musa alayhi salam some of us may know this dua it's in the quran yes the duas which are in the quran are powerful emphatic they are absolute truth so it's highly recommended to memorize them bismillahir rahmanir rahim rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri wahlul 'uqdatan min lisani yafqahu qawli Musa alayhi salam, when he was told, go to Fir'aun, what did he say? He said, Ya Allah, broaden my chest for me, in the sense that allow the knowledge to be captured. Yes, Rabbi shrah li sadri, wa yassir li amri, and make the task easier for me. Wahlul uqdatan min lisani yafqahu qawli, and untie the knots in my tongue, so that the, I am able to speak eloquently. So when it comes to the examination, when you're writing this, is also... Uh, recommended. There is a dua which says, "Allahumma j'alli fi qalbi nuran wa basaran wa fahman wa ilma." Oh Allah, place in my heart light, understanding, cognizance, and knowledge. Yes, also recommended. It is recommended before you leave to the examination, recite rukatain qada al hawaij. Highly recommended also to practice what is known as the tawassul of the ahl al bayt, and within that. Just a tip for you, one thing that I've tried, some other Ayatollah Khu'i, Rahmatullahi Ta'ala Alayhi, he's actually mentioned this. He said, gift and act a good deed, even if it's Surah Al-Fatiha, for the soul of Umm Al-Baneen, Salam Allahi Alayha, the mother of Abbas, Salam Allahi Alayhi. It's highly recommended, very much tried and tested. I saw this in my own eyes, just to give you a story to break this, um, this answer. Uh, and for you to remember this story, this brother who I knew was in Hajj. And we went one year in Hajj. And he, at that time, it was maybe about five years ago. And it was, you know, he was very fond of his iPhone. It just came out at that time. It was, it was new. And uh, he went to what is known as the Rami of the Jamarat. You know, the shaitans that people throw seven stones, at least the big, middle, and the small. So he had his phone with him. He has a couple of phones. He had the small basic phone and his iPhone. So... Unfortunately, once he was pelting, he thought or he believed later that the phone was stolen. Came back very distraught, very unhappy, you know, I've lost my phone, I can't believe it, and so on and so forth. And, you know, he's really um, depressed about it. So he was told, look, why don't you try and ask Allah in the name of Umm al-Bani, salam alayhi alayha. Recite Fatiha of Umm al-Bani. He said, what are you talking about? There are millions of people here. How would I get my phone back? Yes, it's impossible. He said to him, just do it. You know, you have nothing to lose. You've got to also believe. Ma khaba man tamassaka bikum. Yes, you've got to believe that if it's good for you, you'll get it back. You've got to believe. He said, very well. He recited. Yes, Surah Fatiha for the soul of Umm al -Bani. After a few hours, he got a call on his other phone, which had the Saudi SIM card on it. And it's somebody, he said to him, Salaam alaykum, he said, Salaam He said, brother, did you lose a phone? He said, yes, I did. He said, yes, I found it. He said, really, how did you find this number? He said, I went through the phone and I saw this says Saudi number and I called you. This is not a Hollywood movie. It's true, yes? I know the brother and he told me and we, were, we saw him in Hajj, not with our group, but I saw him and he told me the story, yes? So he said, where are you? He said, I have to go Jeddah. Uh, I'll bring your phone tomorrow. So he brought the phone and he handed it and it was exactly, you know, how it is. and he wanted to kind of gift him something. He said, I want to give you something. He said, no, 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 I'm not taking anything. Just pray for me. And he left. Yes? These things work. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to, for example, excel in an exam or to get that job or to get that child that you are being trying, for example, between the husband and wife and so on and so forth, you'll get it. But there's things which will speed the process, inshallah. Can you please describe, it's written very nicely in a very big uh, 
paper. Can you please describe the correct form of tawassul in context of Ya Ali Madad, Ya Rasulullah Madad, Ya Imam Rada Madad, tawassul? Is it help from Allah through the Ma'sumin or from the Ma'sumin themselves? The tawassul and the whole idea of intercession is deeply rooted in the Holy Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in chapter 5, verse 35 says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, taqu Allah wa wabtaqu ilayhi al wasila. This idea of seeking wasila, la'allakum tuflihun. Look for intercession after having got consciousness. Yes, if you look at chapter 4, verse 64, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَوْ أَنَّهُمْ إِذْ ظَلَمُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ جَاءُوكَ فَاسْتَغْفَرُ اللَّهَ وَاسْتَغْفَرَ لَهُمُ الرَّسُولِ This is from the Qur'an, yes? That the Qur'an says, when they come to you, Rasulullah, they ask for istighfar, the Prophet has to do istighfar for them. Amongst many other narrations, as well as the incident of Mubahala, we believe the malediction 24th of the Hijjah, when the Prophet of Islam went with Amir al-Mu'mineen, Imam Hassan and Hussein and Sayyida Fatima in front of these Christians from Najran who challenged him for a malediction. Let's pray to Allah to send his la'na to withdraw the mercy on the group who are wrong. Yes? In the Quran, it says, the Prophet could have gone by himself. It would have been sufficient. Why did he take with him the Ahl al-Bayt? It was to highlight that, look, when you ask Allah, you have a choice. No one's saying you have to. You can ask Allah, no problem. But the problem is Allah is close to us. It's closer to us than our jugular vein. But we're far from Him because of our sins. And it's metaphorical, not easy to understand. But the concept is that these people are chosen by Allah. They're purified. They are uh, individuals who attain proximity. And therefore, you ask Allah in their name. And therefore, the dua will be accelerated and will be accepted. So, what is the best, best method of tawassul? It is to ask Allah in the name of the Ahl al-Bayt. Can I ask the Ahl al-Bayt directly? You can, but with the knowledge that it is what? It's Allah who fulfills. It is Allah who fulfills. So sometimes people go to shrines and say, Ya Imam al-Rada, Ya Aba Abdullah, can you please give me? But it must be the belief that it's not Imam al Hussein who's giving. It's Allah who's giving. But you're asking Imam, it's like, you know, you want, uh, you want someone uh, who's in an authority, yes, to get something done for you, but you can't get to them. So you go to someone who knows them and say, can you please go and ask this person to do this for me? But you go to that person and you speak to them. Similar, this is a figurative example, yes? So some of our brothers who object to tawassul, they say, what are you talking about? Allah says in the Quran, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ When Allah asks you about my, me, my servants, sorry, ask you about me, say to them, I am close. أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِ إِذَا دعان. I respond to the call of the one who calls and supplicates to me. Very well. No doubt the Quran says this. But we have so many barriers and sins. Yes? Why our dua sometimes is not answered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we need things. And the Quran tells us, ابتغوا إليه الوسيلة. Wasila means something that gets you somewhere. In Arabic means it's like a vehicle that gets you from A to B. Yes. So the Quran affirms it. The Ahl al-Bayt, the Prophet affirms it. Final uh, point in Sahih Muslim. This is found in Sahih Muslim. That um, the Prophet of Islam was visited by an, a person who is blind. He said to him, Ya Rasulullah, I am blind. Can you pray for me that I become Someone who can see. The Prophet said, it's better for you to stay blind. You see, sometimes we can't take no for an answer. We won't take it. We want something to happen to us, right? And we want it. So the person said, no, 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 no. I want to see. So the Prophet said, let me teach you what you should do. This is in Sahih Muslim. Not in, Bukha, uh, in Kafi or Bihar al-Anwar. The Prophet tells him, you recite, you do wudu, recite rak'atain salah. Then afterwards, you say, Allahumma inni as'aluka wa atawajjahu ilayka bi nabiyyika nabiyyir rahman. Where have you heard that before? Dua al tawassul, isn't it? Yes. It's there. It's found. Now the answer to that, without going into detail, there's so many questions, mashallah. They reply and say, yes, that's okay. But that was when the Prophet was alive. Now he's dead. While the Quran says, they are still alive. Number one evidence. Number two, every Muslim in Salah, what do they say? Assalamu alayka ayyuhan nabi. Hold on a minute. If he's dead, why are we greeting him? And we are told that when you greet, there must be a response. 
So we believe the Quran tells us and from the actions that the Prophet is alive, the Ahlul Bayt is alive in terms of the soul. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes them hear us, respond to us, yes, and intercede on our behalf. Is there a khula in Shia Islam? Can a female divorce herself from her husband? Well, the system works as such. Khula is when the it's a sister is it's an option or a choice, provided the husband agrees. How would they agree? They would say that uh, the wife would have to give up her dowry, yes, in exchange for being given divorce. So it is still the husband's decision, but it is somehow being presented as a compromise. So the wife comes and says, I don't want this marriage to continue. The husband's happy with that. But, or he doesn't necessarily want that to end, but there is one option, and that is if he agrees to this, then the uh, dowry can be withdrawn or played, paid back again to the husband, and he give, grants her the divorce, which is khula. Of course, on that note, some of our sisters have a bit of concern. They say, okay, you know, why is it that the husband has the final say in divorce. Why can't I have the divorce? You can, but stipulate that before you get married, please. It makes my job much easier, and the job of other ulama, much easier, much easier. We're dealing with so many problems at the moment because our sisters feel stuck in a marriage and it's not working, and we're trying to bring them back together between husband and wife, and it doesn't work. And the husband sometimes says, I'm not giving the divorce, I don't want to. Yes, it's in my hands. Let me flex my muscles. And they do it. Yes. Now, if they're providing for their wife and their, uh, you know, house, uh, I mean, accommodation, food, clothing, then there is nothing, or they're not abusing her, God forbid, physically or, or uh, psychologically. There is nothing the alim could do then. The only way is that to issue a divorce if these rights are not being fulfilled. Now, if there is a prenuptial agreement, between the husband and wife, for example, before they get married, that look, if you do this or if you do that, you do that, the wikala, the representation for divorce, I have. So then she doesn't need, she can divorce herself. If something like, for example, in the agreement, if you marry someone else, or if there is physical beating, yes, or if you leave for another country, we don't live here, or if there's, whatever there's an agreement, there has to be an agreement. And by the way, for those sisters who are not married yet, and I know this is not going to go down well with the brothers, yes? But if you find that the brother is saying, what's going on here? I don't want this at the beginning. You're making it hard. Don't worry. Everything's going to happen. Everything's rosy. Everything's rosy at the beginning. It's always rosy at the beginning. Alhamdulillah. But think about the future. It's your safeguard, yes? Sit there and have a discussion. If there is a conflict and there's no agreement, try to bring ulama or uh, relatives, family members who are what unbiased and try to come to a conclusion for this. Yes, so that both sides are actually happy. Is it permissible to fast on the second and the third day on the Eid of Fatr? Yes, it is. Uh, no problem. Uh, Eid is one day. In the culture of many countries, many different traditions, they celebrate Eid for three days. So this is cultural. Eid al-Fitr, Eid al-Adha, these are the two only Eids in which fasting is prohibited. These two are one day. So as long as you are sure that the other day is not Eid, then you can fast. But I ask you, in this day and age, there is a lot of discussion and disputes and sometimes disagreements amongst ulama with regards to which day is Eid. So it's okay, wait three days and then start fasting. Just in case. Out of recommendation, of course. But if you want the actual Sharia answer, if you're absolutely sure that today, for example, is Eid and tomorrow isn't, according to your marja al taqlid then as far as permissibility is concerned, there is no problem. Many in our community gamble and bet on sporting events. What is the ruling? Haram. That's it. <laughs> it's not allowed to gamble 
and in sporting events, gambling and betting is not permissible in Islamic law under any circumstances. Yes, it is not allowed. All right, it says, my son asked me, how come Nabi Isa is the only prophet without a dad? I couldn't answer. Can you help? No, he's not the only prophet. Who, which other prophet doesn't have a dad? Adam, alayhi salam. Okay, so why Adam and Isa? Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, chooses his prophets and each would come with certain unique characteristics, yes? Why Prophet Nuh perhaps is amongst the oldest, longest living individuals, human beings? Why Nuh and not any other individuals? Why Prophet Yunus was inside the belly of the whales? Why did the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam go on this mi'raj, Isra and mi'raj journey? and saw the Jannah and saw Jahannam. So these are all distinguishing characteristics specifically for certain prophets. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chooses them so that they are lessons. So Isa alayhi salam, Adam, it's an example to what? To mankind that look, not everything runs the way you think as a mechanical system. When Allah decrees something, he does. And it's one of his signs, one of the, the demonstrations of his power and his might. Yes? إِنَّ مَثَلَ عِيسَى عِنْدَ اللَّهِ كَمَثَلِ آدَمْ خَلَقَهُ مِنْ تُرَابْ ثُمَّ قَالَ لَهُ كُنْ فَيَكُونَ It's not a, um, a difficult thing for the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala. So how will he explain it to the children? Well, it's a sign of God's excellence, a sign of God's power, that he makes things happen which are out of the ordinary. It's like a miracle. And he has chosen Isa alayhi salam for that particular purpose. And indeed, um, we find that in the Quran, continuously when there is reference to Isa, it's always what? Isa ibn Maryam. Maryam. And it's like this. It's continuously Isa ibn Maryam. Isa, the son of Mary. Often, we are told when we speak about someone is a reference to their father, not their mother. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is highlighting the position of Maryam, salam Allahi alayha, as well as the miraculous birth of Prophet Isa, Jesus alayhi salam. Why do they call Ali alayhi salam the title the lion? Well, it's because there is a, a poem that's attributed to Imam Ali alayhi salam when he came to fight Marhab in the battle of... Anyone know? Khaybar. So, أنا الذي سمتني أمي حيدرا. That is one um, possibility why Imam Ali alayhi salam is known as the lion. Secondly, simply the lion is a symbol of courage, of valor, of strength. There was no one next to Rasulullah who is even close to Imam Ali alayhi salam when it comes to bravery. But, let's say this absolutely clearly. Imam Ali himself says, when the going got tough in the battlefield, we all hid behind the Prophet. The Prophet sometimes, don't think, God forbid, Amir al muminin was stronger than Rasulullah. Not at all. Yes. Often we speak about the bravery of Imam, but we neglect or we, we don't uh, think or our youngsters don't get the message that as far as the Prophet of Islam is concerned, his valor, his, his courage was something what, which was superior to everyone else. As a revert to uh, Islam, I have always found the religion to be very easy and at one with nature and common sense. However, I struggle with the idea of a human being being najis, spiritually unclean, if they touch me or my food when wet. What is your opinion on this? Especially as I have non-Muslim atheist or polytheist friends and family, how can I think of them as unclean? I can't eat their food just because of difference of belief. Yes, it's a interesting challenge that faces many of us in the West and people often panic and they perhaps overthink about these issues. So uh, the question that we often get is my neighbor is a Hindu, my neighbor is an atheist, they bought me some food and I say to them, sorry, I can't eat it. I reply, first and foremost, please, please don't say to them, sorry, I can't eat it because you're not clean. That's not supposed to be the way, yes? Number one. Number two, who said we can't eat it? Who said? According to our ulama and maraja, everything is tahir unless you know for sure it's najis. That's a rule. Remember this all the time. 
كل شيء طاهر حتى تعلم أنه نجس Now you have a non-ahl al-kitab person they are preparing some food yes the only way according to many maraja today and there is a slight change I'll come to that towards the end some maraja are rethinking this whole concept some already have decided who have passed away but others who are today alive are rethinking this concept the only way where you're not supposed to eat that food is if you see by your own eyes or are told by reliable people whom you trust that they've touched the food with their hands which happens to be wet or they've prepared it with such but you know some of our sisters say to me obviously that's the case in sharia obviously doesn't buy anything you have got to know and you've got to see it so they said to me but i went to the kitchen and i saw it i say don't go to the kitchen don't see it I say what they say, yes that's how it is. They say, but hold on. No, 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 no. Sharia is easy. We make it hard. We make it difficult for ourselves. Yes? Now, if when it comes to this process, we know for sure, 100%, that they have touched it with their wet hands, and therefore, according to many maraja today, it becomes najis. How do we deal with this? And where does it come from? In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal ladheen am uh, uh, the, the verse in Surah Tawbah says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, innama al-mushrikuna najasun. Oh, you who believe, the non-believers, the polytheists are impure. And yes, many other ulama have talked about the fact that they are intrinsically uh, najis. So this najasatu dhatiya, they say, because of the fact that they're not, for example, adhering to, uh, they're not worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they're associating others with the Almighty Of course, Ahlul Kitab, according to many maraja today, the vast, 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 vast majority are tahir. And by the way, only 20 or maybe, no, a bit more, 40 years ago, this wasn't the case. Many maraja actually believed Ahlul Kitab were najis too. But things changed. And I believe even with this issue, things will change. From my interaction and discussion with some ulama, in Najaf and in Qum, they are rethinking, they are revisiting this on a continuous basis. Are we possibly going to see this in the near future? Yes, we're going to see more maraja will come up and say, hold on a minute, this is physical najasa, not intrinsic or spiritual najasa, so to speak. It's when they are physically najis, they've touched something which is impure. It's not because they have disbelief. But that opinion hasn't yet been established, so how do we do it? We deal with it with respect, with understanding. By the way, I'll just give you an example. The Hindus, there is a popular belief amongst the Hindus, and I've checked this with people and Hindus, they say you can't eat food from Muslims. They have this opinion. So in some cases, we have to be brave enough and strong enough and not be afraid to exercise our faith with respect, with dignity, and not to insult others, yes? People today have different backgrounds, different cultures, different expectations, different whatever it is out there. But we have got to have this dignity that we spoke about, this ability to say, you know what, my religion comes first, everything else comes second. I'm not going to compromise. Some occasions, if you feel extreme hardship, difficulty, it will affect you in a negative manner which is intolerable according to the ulama then that's something else that is something else yes but in this regard then we it's similar when it comes to eating in a table where there is alcohol people often have a problem with that yes they say how am i going to do that people don't understand they say hold on a minute you're not drinking but why don't you allow me to drink yes by the way if you study and you look at the uh, recommendations to deal with alcoholism, those who are alcoholics, they say don't go close to alcohol. Don't even sit on the same table if there's alcohol. So if there's a medical reason, similarly, if you're sitting on a flight and next to you the person is uh, suffering with nut allergy, you know what they tell you? Please don't eat nuts. Hold on a minute. Why are you stopping me from eating nuts? I want to eat nuts. Well, out of what? Out of the understanding, courtesy for the person sitting next to you because they'll have a reaction. So medically it's okay, religiously not, they'll respect you, don't worry. Please Allah and don't worry about human beings. You'll see, 
try it. At the end of the day, it feels painful, it feels a bit embarrassing, but ultimately it will bring about positive outlook. And what you are doing is, of course, projecting the correct teachings of the religion of Islam. Sadly, sometimes what happens is if we dilute it, if we somehow try to interpret it our own way or not practice it, there is a lot of confusion out there. A lot of confusion. Let's give you this example. And alhamdulillah, there's so many questions here, but not a single one of them is about shaking hands with the opposite gender, which is maybe a miracle. Um, there was uh, the graduation ceremony at my university when I, uh, alhamdulillah, qualified as a, uh, in a field of pharmacy in the University of London. So we went to the dean of the university and we said to him that, by the way, when you get the hijabi sisters coming to you, when you hand over the certificate, don't shake their hands, please. He says, very well. I'll just bow down and give the certificate. We were sitting in the massive auditorium. Uh, everyone's name is being called. And he saw hands, shaking hands, shaking hands. We're thinking, has he forgotten? Afterwards, we went and he, we said to him, what happened? He said, I swear, I didn't shake. They were shaking my hands. They were the ones who were extending hijabi. Sisters, they were shaking my hands. So, unfortunately, that is when, you know, you think, all right, where am I thinking? What is my priority as far as my faith is concerned? Am I thinking what is right in the eyes of Allah or what I want to do personally? Um, I currently follow a marja that has passed away and I'm not entirely sure if I should change to a living one and if that's even important. Is following a marja actually obligatory? Of course, it is in a Shia jurisprudence. It is necessary to be a muqallid or you can yourself be a mujtahid, even sisters. Yes, you can be a mujtahida, no problem can reach that level, you don't need to do taqlid. Or you do ihtiyat. Ihtiyat means precaution on everything, which is very, very difficult. Extremely difficult because you have to look at all the options for every act in your life, which is very rare to do. Now, as far as doing taqlid of somebody who has passed away, uh, this is a matter of discussion amongst the maraja. The gist of it is some maraja who have passed away have themselves said, you can follow me once I have left this world. So they have left the option for that to happen. If you are already doing taqlid of that marja and they have the opinion that you can follow them after they, uh, they passed away, that's fine. But there are some who say, no, that marja, for example, hasn't said that or hasn't given that permission. So what you've got to do, according to some maraja, again, there's a matter of disagreement, you go to a marja, which is the most learned, and you say, can I follow that marja who I used to follow? Because they've passed away. If they grant you permission, then you can. Let me give you an example. With the case of Ayatollah Khui and Ayatollah Sistani, the followers of Ayatollah Khui have gone to Ayatollah Sistani and have said, can I follow Ayatollah Khui, although he has passed away? By the way, if you've already followed him, not that you've never followed him and he's passed away. So it's not like uh, uh, the taqlid raj'i, to go back and follow somebody who's passed away. So the Sayyid has permitted that. He said, that's fine. You can continue on the taqlid of Ayatollah Khu'i. Yes. And any issues which are current, contemporary, you can come back to the Sayyid. If the Sayyid Khu'i doesn't have a ruling. But there are other examples, like I said, Maraja, who have allowed this to actually happen and have not stipulated that you need to go back to the Marja who is alive. The ayah in the Quran that refers to soulmates, uh, question is, how literal or metaphorical is this ayah? Is it true that each person on this earth has a soulmate? From an Islamic perspective. If so, how does that account from the, for the women who unfortunately end up in abusive relationships? Personally, as a humble student of Islam, from my research on the subject of marriage, I've come to the conclusion there is no subject or agreement or there is no concept of soulmate in Islamic teachings. It is a Western man-made concept. And you know what it does? 
it makes you keep searching and searching and searching and you think I'm looking for my soulmate it's a movie yes you've looked at these movies and you think you know I need to find that perfect individual and you have brothers and sisters who are refusing marriage because I need to find that perfect person. So I once spoke, you know, to a brother. Brother, he's in his mid-30s. Why are you not married? He said, because I'm looking for someone who uh, is religious and is good looking and so on. And also does the cooking and the ironing and the vacuum cleaning. I said, you know, go to Target and get a vacuum cleaner and this. What are you doing? I mean, what is, what is the expectation that you have in your mind about how a wife should be and so on and so forth? So, what do we explain? How do we explain the nafs though? In the Quran, it says, Ulama have said, Min and Fusikum means that they're human. That nafs, this human being, there is a soul, yes? And you don't marry a non human, so to speak, yes? Others have said there is a deeper meaning behind. It means when you get married, you both work together to purify your souls so that the soul reaches levels of perfection and attains happiness and ultimately Jannah. Min and Fusikum. Some have misunderstood this Min and Fusikum to mean the wrong traditions that uh, Hawa was created from the ribs of Adam. That is hugely problematic in Shia uh, understanding. Yes, it exists in some of our Muslim brothers and sisters works and even in our works but we don't necessarily accept it yes this idea and so on and so forth but if we look at it holistically and spiritually this notion exists that it's a combination of the souls in order to complement each other it's as the hadith of Amir Mu'mineen says whomsoever marries have safeguarded half of their faith yes because it's a huge step towards Jannah someone came to Imam Sadiq a lady you know, subhanAllah, throughout history, we have definitely these people who think they know it all, or they think that they're, you know, <laughs> pseudo maraj. They, they came, she came to Imam Sadiq and said, you know, I'm not getting married. He said to her, why? She said, because I want to focus on Allah and do worship all the time. Marriage distracts me. Do you know what he said to her? He said to her, are you better than Fatima al-Zahra? Fatima al-Zahra got married. Do you think marriage distracts from the remembrance of God? It's part of system of life. That's how you should be, you know, living your life. It's not good enough to say, I'm going to somehow isolate myself and live like a monk and practice monasticism because I want to get closer to Allah. No, that's not how you get closer to Allah. You get closer to Allah by being a social being with the ability to sin and to deviate whilst you control yourself. That's how you do it. That's how the teachings of the religion point to. Our tattoos. Of the 14 infallibles halal thank god there was the addition at the end uh, no tattoos generally are halal but um, as far as the ma'sumin as far as the names of the imams are concerned please pay attention to this very important it must not violate their sanctity the ulama say what does it mean you know allah akbar i'm sorry to say this sometimes some people put their tattoos somewhere in their bodies which is really inappropriate yes. najasa might come close to it even though, even though they place it in layers of the skin, which maybe, of course, they have to because then it's a problem for ghusl and wudu. But uh, in terms of the names of the imams is concerned, then it is only allowed if it is not deemed to be violation of their sanctity and, the, and their sacredness. We have to be careful in that particular regard, yes, uh, uh, as far as the ruling of the ulama is concerned. What is the expected etiquette of a scholar? According to the Quran, they must lead, lead by example. They should be individuals who do not only speak and talk the talk, but walk the walk. They should not necessarily um, expect things from the people. They should be humble. They should be at the service of others. They should spread the knowledge. Yes. And their akhlaq should be exemplary, or at least a good mannerism. This is at least some of the, and they're continuously searching for more ilm. They're never satisfied with um, uh, what they have obtained, and they do not hold back from their knowledge. 
So they spread it in, in any shape and form that they possibly can, amongst some other fe features. I don't know how long we have. Okay. In one of your lectures, you said you are proud to be a Shia Muslim, not just a Muslim. What is your opinion? In regards to someone getting married or married to someone who doesn't believe in the wilaya of Imam Ali alayhi salam. In fiqh is allowed. In jurisprudence is fine. If you marry a Sunni sister or a Shia sister marries a Sunni brother, in jurisprudence is not a problem. In practice, it has its challenges. Last year I did two nikahs in the UK in London between Sunni and a Shia. So it goes on. It's not an issue. They meet in university and what? They want to get married. Now, the challenges are though, the challenges are a number. The first is there must be a total understanding of the respect of each other's teachings and no interference, especially if the sister is Shia. Please pay attention to this. What do we mean? If, for example, the Shia sister wants to come from Ajalis or Abdullah, she wants to do Latan, she wants to bring the children, the husband who doesn't maybe like this shouldn't stop that from happening. If the husband, for example, who is uh, from our brothers of Sunnah, wants to name their children some names which the Shia cannot stand, that is also a problem. Yes. So there must be some agreement from the beginning. Number one. Number two. And see a lot of patience to embrace each other's differences. Yes, there are similarities. But also there are challenges. Now, could it be a means by which somebody finds the path of Amir al Mu'minin? It could be. Yes. Some people say, I will try my best, and inshallah, there's guidance. Possibly. There's no guarantees. Often there is, tempt there is resistance, by the way. Because in a marital relationship, what happens is both the husband and wife often try to assert themselves from the beginning. They don't want to be kind of pushovers or, you know, to be treated very, you know, uh, as secondary in a marriage. So, it is unlikely for the husband or the wife to take something after marriage. Before marriage, yes. Before marriage, you find sometimes when, when people, uh, non-Muslims, fall in love with a Muslim or vice versa, they will embrace Islam for the sake of marriage, which we have said it's not always a good thing. They should embrace Islam because of Islam, not because of the person. But it happens many a times and you need to be convinced that the path is the right thing for them. Not later there is a disagreement between the husband and wife and God forbid the person decides to leave the religion. It has very disastrous consequences. So, what happens is that there is resistance to accept the other when it comes to the faith and maybe to embrace each other's teachings or to even move closer towards the madhab of Ahl al-Bayt. So that has to be kept in mind. But I say this with my full respect, and I don't mean to offend anyone, this is our aqeedah. I can bring you proof from the Quran and our hadith. This is our teachings. We say this. If somebody is aware of the wilaya of Imam Ali and the evidence, is aware they're being presented it, and rejects it willingly, Allah does not accept their deeds. Their salah is batil. Everything they do is not accepted. This is the teachings of the Quran and our teachings. Yes, that is the problem. That is the challenge there to keep in mind. And of course, there's always the hope that, inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides and uh, presents people with the opportunity um, to find the madhab al haqq. In regards to marriage, where can a person meet another? Oh. For example, I don't know many people in the community. Is there a halal dating site? Or is there a place to attend to engage in a greater social network of meet and meet eligible singles? I think it's a very important question. Yes. Um, and I did allude to it in one of the nights that we need to be able to provide these solutions. You'll be surprised, brothers and sisters, around the world there are so many of these brothers and sisters who are struggling just because they're simply refusing and it's right their right to refuse just to be given a name and an image and say yeah 
you know, what do you think about this person? And even that option may not necessarily exist for them. So I believe there needs to be a number of things that must be done. Number one, we must utilize our friends network. I often say this to people. You have friends, you actually sit with them and don't be shy, our sister especially. I know it's a bit awkward. I know it's not traditional or cultural. I know people say, oh, how could this be? Sayyida Khadija approached the Prophet and proposed to the Prophet. Do we look at these people as historical figures? MashaAllah, I love Khadija, but I'm not learning from her life. Oh, but she was 1400 years ago. Well, there's more of a need in this day and age than 1400 years ago for this to happen. Now, you utilize our friends network and each friend that we have, we say, please, can you go through your phone contact list? Yes. Yeah. Can you suggest people? It's not being desperate. It's being real. It's being practical. Yes. Now, they, you, you say to your friends, no, I want to get married. Can you find out? Can you ask around? Can you this? You get people working for you. There's no problem with that. Same thing for our brothers. Brothers are normally chilling. They don't have a problem. You know, they can find whoever they want. But even with our brothers, they sometimes struggle because they have certain requirements or whatever. And often they come to scholars. Now, scholars, they were not matchmakers. We're not. I wish we were, and I'm not a scholar, I'm a student, but the ulama out there, you know, when people come to me, I say I would do, I would try my best because my Islamic obligation states that if I can help someone, I should. So what I do is I take the names and whatever, but I forget and I keep them on a list, but then, I, you know, it's an art and you need to be dedicated for this. May Allah bless the matchmakers in our community. So the other thing is we need to encourage people who are real matchmakers in the community, trained and know, yes, and they're being given, you know, information about who is available and so on, what kind of things uh, people look for. They can uh, apply through a form. Some communities have devised these forms and so on and so forth. Now, here's the bit which might sound slightly controversial, but I am trying to get it across in the UK and maybe one day it might happen here. Maybe it does already, okay? We need to provide forums for people to meet. And what uh, there is a proposal at the moment in, in London, which inshallah ta'ala will happen because we have the approval of a mujtahid, and inshallah I'm proceeding with it, is we will have networking events. Not with the idea of come and find your spouse, inshallah you'll be married afterwards, no. It is with the idea that you come, you meet someone and we discuss and round tables, we make the brothers and sisters sit and they will discuss a topic which is not related to marriage. And then we will swap the people around and there will be facilitators there will be a scholar there to supervise to make sure there is no unnecessary interaction or not unnecessary interaction but inappropriate interaction rather and we will encourage those who are silent to speak because sometimes there's extroverts introverts so there's some who sit there and just listen and we will probe them then there is a opportunity to have a meal where people can sit and have a meal then after the event is over we have a team who will contact the brothers. That's where the problem lies. We'll contact the brothers and say, okay, what do you think about this person? What do you think about this person? What do you think about this person? And try and encourage them to think about, you know, perhaps having a meeting and then we leave it up to them to arrange a meeting and so on and so forth. Is this allowed Islam? Islam? Yes, there is no problem. Provided it's in a controlled environment, provided things happen which are, you know, obviously not outside of Sharia and ideally supervised by a scholar, that's fine. Yes? It's not Islamic dating uh, or speed dating. No, no, it's not that, you know. It's with the intention to have an increased opportunity for people to actually meet. What happens is at university campuses and colleges, people get to meet, people sit, you know, and, and, and they interact with others. Why is it that just because they're a hijabi and a brother is a Muslim brother or Shia brother, they can't necessarily have that uh, modest and formal, at least, uh, interaction? to see who is suitable, what is the necessary uh, requirements and so on and so forth. So that is one idea that's being presented out there as a possibility. I encourage my brothers and sisters, if you have ideas, to come forward. It's great. We need to act on new ideas and start moving forward. Because I tell you, we can't stay as the system that existed 50 years ago or 60 years ago. We can't do the same thing. We have to be able to look to 
new ways within the boundaries of Sharia to facilitate things for our brothers and sisters, to make life better and easier. Because I tell you, I'm sure there are brothers and sisters all around Australia in areas which there aren't. The community isn't great, isn't that big as far as number is concerned, yes? And maybe they're looking, they're looking into places like Sydney or Melbourne and other places and they can't find someone who's suitable and so on. So it may, uh, it may help and it is a lot of reward for matchmaking too. Yes, there's a lot of reward. When you place happiness in the hearts of two people, yes, that's a great in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if you're into that, if you're keen, if 